Let's talk about something specific that's near and dear to me. Obviously, Chuck, Mars. Yes, planet Mars. I knew you, you were about to I blur it out. I was about to go there. Yeah. So right now, uh, as a, we're recording, just c- last week, a paper that had been published over a year, or about a year no, ago. No, the paper just came out. The discovery had been... The discovery, Yeah, Thank the you. initial discovery. Explain that, year. yeah. Please. There is a, a rock on Mars that the Perseverance rover studied. Oh, yeah. This is the, what's called the, what they call it a potential, potential biosignature, but is the most promising potential biosignature. What Sign makes pot- it promising? What are we looking at? It's, it's leopard be- spots. They're called, yes, the, <laughs> the technical term, the, the casual term, leopard spots. But what they, they found on this piece of rock is they found biologic, you know, kind of organic traces overlaid. Carbon, carbon, carbon compounds. Yeah, carbon compounds, which are the building blocks of life, overlaid with various kind of these uh, shapes and patterns in the rock that on Earth are always made by biological, biological systems. systems. Right. And uh, so bacteria, it's not, yeah, like exa- yeah, little right, bacteria. Guys, yeah. And so if we had found this rock on Earth, we'd obviously the, the bacteria made this. Oh, that's, that's what we'd say. So we'd say bacteria there was, there'd be no obvious other explanation on Mars. There, so they can't fully say that it is because there, there are some unlikely, but possible, what they call abiotic, uh, natural ways to make this, that they can't completely rule out. But we have a sample of this thing that if we wanted to, we now have hy- this paper put forward a series of hypotheses that we can test. We have to do them here on Earth because we need the, the big expensive equipment to do it. But we have the ability right now, there's a piece of rock on Mars that we could bring back and say, was this life? And it's in a tube. It's in a tube ready to go. And hopefully, so hopefully ready to go. There is no plan to return these. Yes. So we have this and the White House budget uh, canceled the effort to bring back those samples. What motivated canceling that? Chuck's thing about what are you wasting money on? Who cares? That, uh, yes, uh, money is a big part of it. This belief that, oh, humans will just pick it up anyway, so I guess why, why bother having robots so do it? Every, if uh, I may digress, Chuck. Yes, please. Surveyor 3? Surveyor 3. Exactly. I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> so uh, you ever heard of Surveyor 3? I have not. Uh, before we landed humans on the moon with Apollo sent a few spacecraft that weighed uh, the, the foot pad, the cool-looking pancakey foot pads, had the same, about the same weight on them on the moon as was planned for the lunar excursion module, the thing taking the people. So it landed Surveyor 1, 2, and 3, and then Apollo 12 astronauts in the cool go-kart. Yes. No, they didn't have the go-kart yet. They landed next to it. They didn't have the oh, go-kart see, until that's Apollo why he's 15. Here. That, uh, thank As you. It, of course, right? I mean, everyone knows. Yeah, well, he does know that. <laughs> He's the wonk man. So they walked over to it. Moon walked over to it. Oh. And brought back a piece of the camera or camera related. Mm-hmm. It's cut off some pieces of the yeah. spacecraft. And, and brought it back to Earth. And I was a kid during this. Oh, my goodness. Microbes have survived for two years on the moon. They found micro. Yeah, they found some potential microbes on it. But then it turned out. It was our microbes? That mm-hmm. we just contaminated it here on right. Earth, just screwed it up. Now, I don't, so, I don't think there's any uh, fear of that on Mars, though. Well, there's, that's, I think the fear is the right word, or a, a concern, maybe, is the thing. My fear, or anxiety, or taxpayer arms akimboticness, is if you send people, you're going to contaminate it. You're going to make a mess. And then will you be able to determine, distinguish between what may have grown the leopard spot patterns or what humans brought by accident. Mm-hmm. And this is not rocket surgery. This is obvious to me. Dirty little secret. Every uh, astronaut spacesuit leaks. It's constantly leaking little bits. And, you know, we're just these walking bags of bacteria and viruses, yes. right? And so it's just we're walking around on Mars. You, you're just like shooting off little viruses and bacteria just in this air around you. It's functionally impossible to do what's called planetary protection, this idea that you have to not infuse another planet with your own biome. And as humans, you know, so when we send robots, we bake them at 500 degrees, you know, for three weeks to kind of kill everything or cover kind them of, with acid. sort of kill yeah. everything. Yeah. yeah. And, but with, you can't bake an astronaut at 500 degrees. To Although make there's well, a few. Well, I wouldn't know. I guess if you, you could, do, they are delicious. They, they're a lot, <laughs> they're a lot less effective on. as an astronaut. Whoa, well, that's, <laughs> that's getting a little weird. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little. So anyway, this argument the is clear 
uh, on to Star Talk audience, I can make this argument that you can't send people will contaminate. You won't be able to distinguish distinguish what you were looking for from what you brought by accident. Yeah. Right. Well, there's but, yeah, there's a number of reasons you can't have people necessarily do it because it's also where you land on Mars. Can humans get to where they sent the robots? Maybe not. They landed in this big rocky crater. Humans will have to land in a big flat, the safest possible space. Right. Um, big runway. Can you get close enough? If you're landing in a big rocket, will you just kick up so much dust and debris that you damage everything? There's a lot of problems with this. Plus, uh, more to the point, at no point in history ever has adding humans to a space mission made it cheaper or happen faster. Right. That adds complexity. Makes sense. Because right. you're bringing bubbles of Earth with you exactly. to keep you alive for that right. amount of time. And also, we, we require a lot of maintenance. <laughs> we are we are quintessential high maintenance. I, I have a toddler right now, so I resonate with that very strongly. So with this in mind, the last budget proposed for bringing back these rock samples, this is an acronym everybody loves, is... MSR, Mars Sample Return. I think it's the worst, just the worst name. What would be a better name? Uh, you know, that's a great question that I don't have an answer for. Can I just be the critic on it without having to Mars offer a Mars Rock, solution? call it back. Bring back better. Bring them back. Well, I have my <laughs> Mars Sample Return, Bring Them Home uh, t-shirt on right now. But I always think well, sample makes it. people think of like the doctor. Like, like the Bring Them Home is pretty cool. Yeah. Because that, that elicits a different type of Bring Them Home. And the word home mm -hmm. is evocative. Yes. Right, yeah. I mean, there's, call it just something cool, like the, the Athena mission. I don't know, right? There, there's just, it's sample return just sounds very, you know, clinical yeah. and yeah. kind of kind of static, where this is a but really ambitious. This is it a true fact or a false fact that the last bid was $11 billion, right? That was one of the reasons that it, things were, there's, there's deeper technical reasons to do this because you're not lots of novel technology. You have to land, go back to where there's a rover now, land next to it, somehow get the samples onto a rocket that you land on the surface of Mars that can sit there for two years on its own. And then why two years? Because it takes two years to get to Mars and come right and uh, land and come back. You have to orbits. launch on these cycles. Yeah. And then it has to launch itself, go into orbit, rendezvous with itself with another spacecraft, all mm -hmm. autonomously, mm -hmm. and then come back to Earth without you know getting anything dirty. With so it's not seven minutes stuff. of terror, it's two and a half. It's two years and a half. Years. I mean, it's incredibly difficult. It's all stuff you have to do if you want humans to go to Mars, right. ultimately anyway. Yeah, I was saying it's a it's a it's a great dry run for when exactly. we go. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, and I don't know if you can answer this. Mm -hmm. Are there benefits that we would glean from doing this that have nothing to do with the Mars mission, but that would end up spilling over into our everyday life? Yeah. This type of stuff, when you set extreme limits for yourself, why do people run triathlons? Why do people run marathons? Why does Mercedes you know, build cars for F1 racing, right? These are extreme, they, they seek out extreme conditions so you can practice and train yourself to be extremely good at something and have high precision, have high capabilities, and figure out how to do really hard things. So it makes your manufacturing better, it makes your engineers better, and it motivates and challenges people to pursue these incredibly difficult things that then go out and just make the world better through their own you know, spin-off businesses and technologies. You need a goal like this, right? It, it just sets this bar. And these types of, again, autonomy, Right, robots know how to do things is kind of a big deal right now. Right, we're figuring out how to do that, and there's so, huge reasons to so do that. So you threw in the word reason. Mm -hmm. Why does anybody want to bring these rocks back, at all, bring these rocks home mm -hmm. in the first place? Well, the the life question, right, is a big one. That's it for me. Well, if we were, I claim, if we were to discover life on another world, it would change life on this world. That's my claim. Thank you.